sometimes it's <clears throat> difficult, just about every time, to try to condense something down to 20 minutes or 25 minutes the most. At least I have a hard time doing it. Well, you do that in the pastor's mic. No, if you haven't noticed, I've not been able to do it lately on the pastor's mic with the subject I started on on, on uh, the Last Supper and the Passover. But that's just one continuous message. I just break it up in shorter periods. Tonight I want to answer this particular person's questions in about 20 minutes so I can move on to tonight's message. And I, sometimes I find that difficult to do because there's so much information. So much that needs to be said that and I probably won't say it all tonight, but <clears throat> I'm going to give it a go. Open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Now, I've received this question. I'm reading now the last day message you just sent out on the 69 weeks. Question is on Daniel 9.24. Let's just read Daniel 9.24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, I have read everything possible you can read on this particular subject, believe me. And you could walk away with many different answers. A lot of them say the same things over and over, just in their own style, the way they say it or the way they write it. But you still walk away scratching your head. It's just blah, 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 blah. They put nothing in order. They make sense of nothing. They create made-up doctrine to try to make some sense of it. But anyone with any eschatology background, when I say eschatology background, studying it for years, come up wanting. They're still not satisfied with the answer that's given. Even the people that subscribe to the opinions, not opinions, to the verifiable word of God that we preach here on this subject matter. And this person wrote in and said, I understand through the last day's teaching that the following were completed, referring to verse 24 in chapter 9 of Daniel. I understand through the last day's teaching that the following were completed within the 69 weeks. As you say in the message, this is what's going to be accomplished in a 69-week period of time. And I said that. It had a starting point, and the 69-week period of time would end at the cross. All would, be, all would be fulfilled by the time Jesus died on that cross. And this person lists the six things in verse 24. Finish transgression, two, number one. Number two, make an end of sins. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up vision and prophecy. And number six, to anoint the most holy. The first one, what was the transgression? Who were the transgressors? What was the transgression and who were the transgressors? As we are discussing it here this morning, and we are under the understanding that the transgressions would be the occupation of Israel by foreign rulers. No. That's just a byproduct of what happened because of the transgressions, but that's not it. I can't recall, but Rob thinks you, oh, excuse me, I just gave a name, sorry about that. But this person thinks you did teach this was the transgression. But if it is, and the ruling of Israel was returned to the Jews in the hands of 1967. Maybe that, I can't recall that if you taught this was a transgression. But if it is, and the ruling of Israel was returned to the Jews' hand in 1967, then this was not completed in the 69 weeks. But in the seventh week, 1967. So we are having some difficult, you know, we have some disconnect here. Being in this section of scriptures about the Jews in Jerusalem, if the transgressor is the Jews, then most Jews in Israel are still in transgression. 
So I'm having difficulty seeing how it is finished. Of course, if I knew what exactly the transgression was, this might help me in seeing how it is finished. First of all, you got the timeline all messed up. <clears throat> and first, and let me explain why. Because obviously your understanding of it was if the transgression had someone else rule in Israel, well, that never came to an end. And in this case, till and in, 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 well, in Israel till 1947 became in 1948 would have became an independent state, but not until 1967 when Jerusalem was back in Israel's hands. That's not what it's saying. That's not what finished transgressions mean. Let's look at it. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. And we already know, if you look, go to verse 25, this 69-week period starts, this verse 25 reads, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth, the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah. That starts the timeline, the clock ticking on the timeline, when that commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem was given unto the Messiah when Jesus arrived in the flesh. Now we know that in 444 B.C., Artie Erxes granted a special decree, and I said this in the message, to who? To Nehemiah. To go back and do exactly what was given as a prophecy during these 69 weeks. In this case, to start the 69 weeks. To restore and to build Jerusalem. It has nothing to do with the temple, by the way, which too many of you get confused. To build Jerusalem always symbolizing, symbolizes, started with, symbolizing the outer wall that surrounded the city. A city wasn't a city in the Old Testament unless it had the wall of protection. In a sense, a symbolism of in the flesh, what already God has done in the spirit, if you trust and faith in him. So when Artie Erxes in 444 B.C. granted that special decree, here we have it in verse 25. It doesn't say that exactly. You just have to know your biblical history. This starts at 69 weeks. This starts the 69 weeks period. And the very first thing that we see, necessary, these won't all be in order, by the way, but let's, let's take a look at it. The very first thing you see in verse 24 is to finish the transgression. To finish the transgression. So what does that mean? And you need to write this down, because I didn't cover this the first time around. I just went right through it quickly, because I wanted to concentrate on the timelines. But let me concentrate a little bit on this right now, so you have a better understanding. Literally to, write this down, to restrain transgressions. To restrain transgressions. To restrain the punishment which they were experiencing for the last 70 years as was prophesied by the prophets before that period. As was prophesied. They were exiled taken by Nebuchadnezzar as captives, the city destroyed, burned down, and headed east to the Babylonian Empire. And they were exiled there, just as the prophets said what God told them to say because of their continuous rebellion. They will be exiled. We know about 100 years Prior to that, the northern tribes were taken away by the Assyrian Empire for their rebellion. And now Judah, the southern kingdom, was taken away. So to restrain the punishment, what punishment? The punishment they were experiencing during those 70 years. This transgression or punishment came about because of their continuous Rebellion, which 
rejected God's authority over their lives. Nothing's really changed if you really think about it. That's been man's problem from day one. The continuing rebellion and rejection over God's authority over our lives. Now to restrain, write this down also, means to hold back. Not to finish the transgression. Actually, that's not what it even says in the Hebrew. A better translation would be to restrain the transgression, to re hold back the punishment that was being delivered, that was prophesied for 70 years on this rebellious group of people who were exiled and taken away from their whole land, homeland and their holy city Zion. To hold back the punishment. And that's what exactly, that's what Daniel was praying for earlier in the chapter. You need to read that prayer again. That's what Daniel's prayer again to remind God what Jeremiah pro prophesied. What ex exactly went down and what happened and what they were experiencing for 70 years. So God says through Daniel, okay, not to finish transgressions. In these 70 weeks, I'll restrain the punishment because of the transgression. And they transgressed continuously. And what was the thing that aggravated and angered God the most? They're falling away and following other gods. False gods, false worship, their neglect to take care of the things of God. So God now is going to hold back his transgression. That's what Jesus does for us, folks. In some of the Hebrew literature, to hold back also means a net is cast. Here I am in this side, on my left side, and here I am in the right side. Well, here's my sins on the left side, and here I am without sin on the right side. God is looking to, at me at, in the right side perspective, not in the left side perspective. If you're looking at my hands, I'm pointing sins to my left without sin on my right. Does it mean I'm not sinning? No, but that God doesn't see me that way any longer because what Christ did on the cross, this has dual application, not only to restrain the transgression that was promised, to the Jews, to Judah, but also with Christ on the cross for us. There's that shield that blocks our sin because our sins are blotted away through Christ, which God now doesn't see those sins because he sees us through Christ and Christ is sinless. So he's holding back our transgressions. Why? Because he took the blow for them. And as we keep sinning, and I haven't met one yet, you know how good of a Christian you think you might be, you don't sin probably at least once a day. I know I sin more. But they're held back. They're held back. But the word also has a different meaning, not a different, an added meaning in the transgression part of this verse. That means we were separated. The transgression in the Hebrew means you were separated from or separated off of something or from something. So here we have the restrain part now that God promised Daniel's praying for that restraint to be applied now because the time period has gone by. The 70 years of punishment and now he's praying that the separation no longer be there. What separation? We pray that separation from God no longer be there. We can pray that because we have Christ and what he fulfilled at the cross. He reconciled us back. 
we are no longer separated from these people for this time, for this specific reason, they were separated. Now Daniel's praying for that separation no longer to be there because the, the restraint, I mean, the, 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 the time of 70 years has passed by and he's praying, praying now for the restraining of those 70 years of the transgressions to be no longer there but restraint, no longer punished, but restrained. Hold back now, Lord. The time of our punishment is complete. What you prophesied through Jeremiah, what we would go through because of rebellion with you, against you. That's completed. No longer, no longer we need to be separated anymore. Bring us back to our homeland. Bring us back to Zion. Bring us back to the holy city of Jerusalem. Time has passed. So literally, it should be to restrain transgression. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon that holy city. Seventy weeks. That means at the beginning of the first week, the first day, the first minute, the first hour, as I declared in the message that I preached that you received in a written format and also you can view in the archives, that's when the restraint for the transgressions that happened prior to the 70 years has to come in play. It's the thing that kicks off the 70th week, I mean the 69 weeks, or the 70 weeks, excuse me. It's the thing that kicks off the seven weeks, but we'll concentrate on the 69 weeks because the 69 weeks takes us all the way to the cross. No, to restrain. To restrain, which means to hold back the punishment which separated us from you, from the homeland, Zion, from the holy city, Jerusalem. So God's telling Daniel, seven weeks are determined on that people upon the holy city to restrain the transgression. So in a sense, to begin the period where no longer God would punish him for what he punished him for, which led them into the exile, into the Babylonian empire, dooms of darkness for those 70 years. Get it, folks? It's important that you understand this. What kicked off the 70th week was the restraining of the transgression. Or in other words, the restraining of the punishment which they were experiencing for 70 years. And then it goes on to read, let's see if I answer that question completely or as best as I can for now. So it's nothing to do with some future event that takes us all within really 19 67. I don't know where you got that from. I really don't. Because I made it quite clear that, oh, this was to happen in the 69 week period of that last day, part four message. I can't recall, but I think you taught this was the transgression. But if it isn't, but if it is, and the ruling of Israel was to return to Jews' hands in 1970, this was not completed in 69 weeks, but in the seventh week. Well, get that out of your mind. This has nothing to do with that. Nothing whatsoever. And in fact, I don't have it with me. In fact, if somebody has it, I need that message that we emailed out. Just find it and bring it to me. The 69 weeks, the finished transgression kicked it off. That was the starting point. Actually, the starting point was the decree given by Artie Erxes in the and the, the finishing the transgression, God was done with the punishment. What started off the 69 weeks that would lead up to the cross. Now, the second question was, while I'm generally aware of the sin offering and the trespass offering, the one dealing with our condition of sin, I guess, let's read the verse first. To finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. Okay. And to make reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring an everlasting righteousness.
Well, I'm aware, you know, while I'm generally aware of the sin offering and trespass offering, the one dealing with our condition of sin and the other dealing with our outworkings in that condition, trespasses. Why is this first list iniquity? What does that mean? I would think stating sin and trespasses would be enough, but God adds iniquity as another issue to be dealt with. What is this iniquity? First of all, let me read the verse to you the way it should be read in the Hebrew. And to make an end of sins. Still talking about what got them. Let's just say that, put it this way. So I'm really clear in the most simplistic way. What got them in trouble. The rebellion of what got them in trouble prior to 70 years of punishment. What got them in trouble? Well, I just told you several different things. And that led to the rebellion. Then God restrained the transgression. He held back the punishment. No longer it's necessary. All things were fulfilled up to that point. What God said would happen through other prophets. And now they would no longer be separated. But now they'd be connected again with their homeland. And with the holy city of Jerusalem. Because they got the decree in 444 BC with, from Artaxerxes to go back and to rebuild it. In verse 25. And then it says, and to make an end of sins. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. So don't even bring in what you have learned, which is nothing wrong in what you're saying, but you're applying in the wrong, you're applying with the wrong application here in this verse. Well, I'm generally aware of the sin offering, the trespass offering, the one deal with our condition of sin, and the other deal with our outwards in that condition. Trespasses. Was this verse list, why does this verse list, list iniquity? Well, it doesn't say to make an end of sins. What it says is to seal up the sins, literally. To seal up the sins. Not the sins they would commit once they get back there and start restoring. Not the sins they commit all the way from that point of time to now. Or anybody else's sin. Has nothing to do with that. Has nothing to do with the offerings. This is pointing to the restraining of the transgression, what was holding them back because of the punishment. Now they're back there. Now they're going to be rebuilding. Why? Because as God was restraining his transgression, as God was holding back the punishment, he now comes to the next level of what was prophesied, by the way, also in Jeremiah. To seal up the sins. Okay. That chapter is closed as we would say it. That chapter of the reason why you got in this condition is to start with being exiled, being taken as captives by Nebuchadnezzar under a ruling kingdom that cared less about your God, whether you did or not. That is finished. That chapter is closed. To seal up those sins, the sins why you were punished. It is done. We're moving on to the next phase now. In other words, as we would say, the new start. Doesn't mean they're not going to sin anymore. Couldn't seal up those sins forever. And they would still, for their sins, whether it was once a year or whatever the offering required, have Many different offerings. This is not the sin offering, the trespass offering, but other offerings also. But the sin and trespassing was brought up in this verse. This has nothing to do with that. This is still referring to why they were in that condition in the first place. And the time period prior to that condition, which they rebelled against God, and therefore they were punished for that condition. Take it to the cross again, if you want to. We, through Christ, because we faith and trust in him. He seals our sins. It doesn't say we're going to stop sinning, does it? Christ knows very well we're not going to stop sinning. We're a sinful creature. But he knows that he paid the price to claim us for his own. And the sins will not reach the Father because as they're reaching him, because he's our mediator, he's putting a seal on them. If he sees, 
we're still fading and trusting in him. If you don't fade and trust in him, this message is not for you anyway. So it doesn't say to make an end of sins. It doesn't say any of that. It's the seal of sins. Let's move on to reconciliation for iniquity. Reconciliation. What was reconciliation? I always told you some of the methods they use. I used, I used one for an example in one of the past messages. Reconciliation was basically cutting a covenant. That's what it literally means. Coven cutting a covenant. In the Old Testament, you made a covenant with God, or in some cases with someone else, you would choose a certain animal, cut the animal in two, put half the animal on the right side, half put it on the left side, either put a flame through it or walk through yourself. And that was as good as a handshake with God or whatever covenant you were making with an individual. It was cutting a covenant. Here is to seal up the sins and to cut the covenant, literally, or to ratify the covenant. Not for iniquity. That's not what it says in the Hebrew. And to ratify the covenant. What covenant? The covenant through the prophets that God has declared that would happen if man, or in this case, the southern kingdom would not repent and turn back unto him again. Once God declares his covenant, he doesn't turn back. Either we line up with his covenant or we stand in the place of punishment. Either you, whether you want to believe it or not, you can't choose your religion it's Christ's way or no way. That's why Christ says, I am the way. The covenant is kept through him. Not through Islam, not through Hindu, not through Buddha, not through Hare Krishnas, not through Kabbalah, not through whatever you think is a pretty neat religion to follow. It's through Christ. That's the covenant he has with us. That's the covenant he made on the cross. But to restrain the transgression, to seal up the sins of what got them in that state of transgression, and once that was done, once the covenant was completed, once the covenant was ratified and brought to the end for what was prophesied, God would give them a fresh start. God would send them back. And that's why I told you, I'm not that impressed with the story of Esther. But I've preached this before. They were in a state of rebellion still because they all had the opportunity with the decree that Artie Erxes gave to go back. They didn't. They didn't. And then they found themselves in a situation with Haman. But that's another story. They should have went back, every single one of them. Oh, somebody else would do it. We're comfortable here now in, our, in the Babylonian territory, which we now claim to be our new home. Really? Is that what God wants you? Is that, was that part of God's covenant? To think any different would be outside of his covenant that he cut and agreed to. That's why to be with any other religion and not being a follower of Jesus Christ, you're just fooling yourself, folks. You're just living under a, an illusion a falsehood. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus. And there's only one way he has cut the covenant. And there's only one way that God prophesied 
through his prophets before even Daniel got this vision how this would go down. And it went down exactly the way he said it went down. And Daniel is now reminding him, this is what's going to happen. I will restrain the transgression. I will restrain the punishment, the punishment you've been experiencing the last 70 years. I will hold back my wrath. I will allow you, I will allow you now to go back so you won't be separated from me any longer, back to the homeland, back to the city of Jerusalem. That's what the Artaxerxes decree was all about. I will seal up the sins of your past. I will forget what got you here in the first place, in other words. And I will do all this because I have agreed by cutting of a covenant. I wish I had time to go back to cutting a covenant again, but I don't. Because the covenant is now ratified. What I said, what would be a punishment, happened. Now it's over. So there is reconciliation now through the covenant I made for all your past sins. That's what it's saying here. That's what Christ did on the cross, too, for us. Even though there's an application for their departure back to their homeland, it also has application on the cross, doesn't it? He kept this covenant for us, for our benefit. He ratified it. For what? To seal up our sins, our iniquities, our rebellion. We'll, st we'll still keep on sinning, I guarantee you. But long as we keep our eyes on Jesus and stay focused up in on him, he sealed those sins. He won't get to the Father. He's like that net that nothing gets through to the Father. How wonderful Jesus really is, if you really think about it long enough. He absorbs it all. So we could have a relationship with the Father. Now, I really don't have much more time to stop with that particular question because I want to get to the third question also. And the third question was about vision and prophecy sealed. How do we explain Revelation in light of this verse? I had to stop and think about that for a few minutes before the program. I note that Daniel was told to seal the book, but other books of the Bible were not sealed. And I would think these two dealt with the same historical times Daniel covered. <clears throat> Let's go back to Scripture. Verse 24, to, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy, like I said in the message, is not a, a, an article, a material article, like the Ark of the Covenant or anything like that. We're not going to anoint anything most holy. Christ has been most holy. But anyway, that's not the subject because that was not part of the question. And to seal up the vision and prophecy, I want you to write down this in your notes because now you know. That's why this will probably be a supplement to the message that I preach on last day's series number four to 69 weeks. To seal up the vision and prophecy. You know how it should read? Write it down. This is what the Hebrew and some of your better Hebrew scholars, the renowned ones of old and of a few hundred years ago, translated to seal up the vision and the prophet. To seal up the vision and the prophet. So the first part of your question, how do we explain Revelation in the light of this verse? That revelation was not coming from any prophet. I want you to stop and think about that question and think about the answer. Was Jesus a prophet? Jesus is the only begotten son of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm not going to reduce him down to a prophet. I don't think this person was. But a prophet, an apostle, or anyone else didn't come up with these prophecies. 
John the Revelator was writing down the message that he received from Christ, no other. So how do I explain the revelation in light of this verse? This has nothing to do with what this verse here says in Daniel 9, 24, because it says to seal up the vision and the prophet. I, was, I know that Daniel was told to seal the book. Well, let me go back. Let me just read part of the message I preached. Page 11. Okay, I understand one, two, three, four, and six events were filled at the cross. It should really, really by the cross. But you said one of these events was not fulfilled at the cross. That's right. Event number five was not fulfilled at the cross. What was the event number five? The fifth event was sealed up vision and prophecy. Now I've gone even further, and I told you it's not just sealed up vision and prophecy. It should read sealed up vision and the prophet. Any prophet. I'm telling you tonight that the fifth event was fulfilled in 396 B.C. The vision was fulfilled, or the vision of prophecy was fulfilled. The vision of prophecy was fulfilled in 396 B.C., in 396 B.C., the prophet Malachi wrote the final book that we have in the Old Testament. If we take the seven times seven Old Testament years that have been given to us here in Daniel, that seven times seven equals 48.3 soul years. 444 B.C., the, the decree that was given by Artaxerxes, minus 48.3 years, it comes out to 395.7 B.C. Coincidence? I don't think so. 396 B.C. is with vision and prophecy, or the prophet now, as you know, as I just told you. The fifth point in verse 24 was fulfilled. Take the weeks of years in the starting timeline of 444 B.C., which we already have and subtracted the 488.3 years. This equals 395.7 B.C. or 396 B.C. approximately. Remember, this is the vision. This is when vision and prophecy were sealed up or the prophet sealed up. A Jewish rabbi in 200 B.C. wrote lamenting in 200 B.C., 195 years, give or take, after it was sealed up, wrote lamenting that the Holy Spirit had departed from Israel. Go to Romans 11, 7. Paul is speaking about Israel, God's chosen people. Quote, what then? Israel had not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election had obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them a spirit of slumber. As it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear unto this day. Since 395.7 B.C., Israel, specifically the Jews, have been in a state of slumber with their, eye, with, with their eyes can't see because they are blinded and they can't hear outside of a few. Not only did a rabbi limit before Christ, it is what Paul declared in his letter to the Romans. God blinded their eyes so they would not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Why? They literally were hardened. He gave them plenty of, they gave, he gave them plenty of chances. Look at the biblical record. So I'm not going to try to simplify this. I'm not very good at simplifying things sometimes, but maybe you will get it if you haven't already. We begin in 444 B.C., the seven weeks of years. Let's just use weeks. Minus the 48.3 years. This takes us to 396 B.C., where the Old Testament closes. Then you have 62 weeks. So you get, so you get 62 weeks, so you, so you get to 32 AD. Daniel 9, verse 26 says, The Messiah, after three score and two weeks, shall be cut off. So the Messiah is cut off right on the dot. And it goes on and on. You can read the message yourself if you have received it. It makes it very clear. The seven and the 62 weeks and the symbolism of the exact dating, in my opinion, that went on. Now, you can say all you want, because it goes on to say that I know that Daniel was told to seal the book, but other books of the Bible were not sealed. And I would think that these two dealt with the same historical time discoveries. That's right. And in fact, they d dealt with some of the same things, but not all of them, because some are writing to the northern kingdom, which had another prophetic outcome and a different timeline, by the way, than the southern kingdom. In fact, when Daniel was alive, 
Jeremiah was still alive towards the end, but he probably already sailed off, not sailed off, but went through after coming from Egypt, going through probably Israel again, or whatever route he took. And he was gone by the time Daniel got this vision. And Daniel got the vision around 605 to, you know, I'm probably closer to 530 B.C., give or take. And then a contemporary of Daniel was Ezekiel. And after Ezekiel, or at the same time as Ezekiel, you had Nahum. And then after Nahum, you had Haggai, Zechariah, Joel, around 500 B.C., you had Obadiah, then finally Malachi. Now, all these prophets, yes, they did have some prophecies. But without Daniel, even Ezekiel could not be clarified, or Jeremiah. Let's stick with the major prophets. Then you have the minor prophets, which has prophetic outcomes in their writings, including Malachi, including Joel, including Zechariah. And then along with the major prophet, Ezekiel. All these prophets, whether major or minor, try to figure out a timeline. Try to figure out events that verifies God's word. You can't. You just can't. I have tried sideways, backwards, upwards, downwards, every different direction you can try. You can't make out a timeline with any of these prophets. But when you see Daniel and also the book of Revelation, in some cases, side by side, then all these other major and minor prophets come to play and you can piece all these things together. So even though other books were not sealed, all those other books were already written before 396.7 or 395.7 B.C., so in this case, you say they're not sealed, but nothing really, truly was written after the period when they would be, the prophet would be sealed. Find me anything after 395.7 that has any significance to it uh, that you can use in the study of eschatology that can be verified in God's word. Try. A lot of people say they can do things. Do it. Try. And then if you're successful, send them to me. I don't expect anything, any, anything from anyone anytime soon. I can guarantee you that. You're looking at one stubborn individual that has to see it to believe it in too many cases. Been there, done that. You're not going to find it, what I'm trying to say. How do we explain it? Revelation, a lot of this verse, it, well, let me tell you right now. Revelation was not given by no prophet. That's how I explain it. It was given by Jesus himself. And without that, Daniel would make much sense either. Or at least not, you could make some sense of it, but you won't have the completed prophetic outline without the book of Revelation. That's why it was important that John received that revelation through Christ. And he wrote it down, I believe, word for word. even though they deal with the same historical, not all the same, because not all the minor prophets were the prophets to, for instance, Judah. Nahum, for instance, a minor prophet, after uh, or at the same time as Daniel, was a prophet to Nineveh, for instance, the city. So not all the minor prophets. Obadiah, he was a prophet to Edom. Do you get the idea, folks, what I'm trying to get across? All vision and not prophecy was sealed. And to seal up the vision and the prophet. And what I just read to you, if you go back and read again, and starting in page 11 in the Last Day Series Part 4 written sermon, page 11 
and through page four will give you the timeline and how you calculate that timeline to know when exactly the vision and the prophet would be sealed until Jesus came. And then he revealed after his resurrection the book of Revelation to none other than John, the revelator. And that was a missing piece of the puzzle. Not so much for the prior years leading up to 48 and 67, that's 1948, 1967, but what might happen after that period, which we haven't covered yet. Now, don't get me wrong, it's important because a lot of things lead up in the book of Revelation during that time period, up to that time period. But it was kind of vague through the minor and major prophets, even though you can probably have some guesswork and creative thinking to try to piece something together, you still not have the details like we would have when the book of Revelation was given to John by Jesus himself. But that's all things yet to cover. I don't want to confuse that matter with more additional information, which I'm not even ready to deal with yet. Do you get it to understand, folks? To recap briefly, to restrain the transgression, or literally means to restrain the punishment, which they were experiencing for the last 70 years. And, John, and Daniel knew that 70-year punishment period was over. He prayed that prayer, starting in chapter 9 in Daniel. And they restrained the punishment so they would no longer be held back in going back. Now for the second layer of prophecy to restore and build. They were not separated any longer. Some took advantage of that decree, that special decree that was given to Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the city. And that's what they did. And that was the starting point of the 69 weeks. Read Daniel's prayer once again. It's the, the make end of sins was to seal up the sins that led them into this bondage. Because God cut a covenant. He kept it. He ratified it. And what they experienced for their iniquities was over. Now they had a new, fresh start. And that's what happened. And then it goes talking about everlasting righteous and anoint the most holy, and then you get to the 70th week. That's what happened. For our sake, you can apply all these things to the cross, too, if you make the right application. Christ held back, and he's still holding back our sins, our transgressions from God the Father so we could be reconciled to him. Thank God. Everybody celebrating his birth now if you're a Christian, even though he was not born on December 25th. Thank God he was born. Thank God he did what he did for us. Because in a sense, he did a lot more for us on that cross than he even did for his people, his chosen people, listed here in 924. But that's another subject. Play this song. I said I was going to take 20 minutes. I took 40 minutes. And I still had left a lot out. But in the months and maybe a year ahead, maybe two years, who knows how long this series will take, and maybe until Jesus comes back, I'm more than likely will come back to these subject matters over 